I've met the Bell crew oh, at least a dozen times, and the man that fascinated me the most was the tail gunner, Bob Quinlan. And he was a character, and also their left waist gunner, Bill Mitchell. And uh, we've had some great times together, and the luncheons and so forth, when they were on visits here. Uh, they're a bunch of wise guys, and they're always cracking jokes and carrying on, you know. I don't think there was a serious guy on board the whole ship. They're a real, real bunch of nice guys including Captain Morgan, a real, real nice pilot. He originally was going to name the airplane My Little One in honor of Margaret Polk, who he met when he was up in Seattle. She was up there visiting her sister, and they fell in love and uh, became engaged. Uh, and He was going to name the airplane My Little One. Well, they went to Bangor, Maine, were getting ready to jump off overseas. And him and the uh, co-pilot went to a movie with Joan Blondell and John Wayne in Lady for a Night, which was about a riverboat uh, queen. And Joan Blondell played the riverboat uh, madam, so to speak, and the boat's name was the Memphis Belle. So he saw that and said, ah, that's, that's what we're going to name the airplane. Some people say it was the boat, and some say it was the girl. Well, we'll we'll take either one, but we think of uh, Miss Polk as the as the true Memphis Belle. So that's that's how it got its name. And so they went overseas, and he told the crew he was going to name the air, wanted to name the airplane the Memphis Belle. Well, they all had a vote. Everybody chipped in names, and they all had a vote on what they were going to name their airplane. And uh, I only know this because the radio operator Bob Hansen t uh, told me about it when we were last talking to him about two months ago. He said, yeah, that Morgan wanted to name it the Memphis Bell. Everybody else had a name. So he bribed three of the crew members with a three-day pass if they'd vote for Memphis Bell. So three of the crew members got a three-day pass and they voted for Memphis Bell. In the spring of 1943, um, winning the war was not an accepted um, fact. 
it wasn't a sure thing. Uh, we're losing 60 percent, you know, 60 planes a day and bombing runs over Europe with no fighter escort. Uh, we just got our butts kicked out of Kazarine Pass, North Africa. We're getting kicked off of one island after other in the South Pacific. We were not winning the war. And, uh, and the Air Corps was having some difficulty uh, keeping the morale up uh, because uh, basically uh, getting assigned uh, to the 8th Air Force, particularly the big league, which was the major operating unit in the Army Air Forces, uh, was basically tantamount to a death warrant. And uh, so the Memphis Bell crew, uh, this was good news. You could actually survive a tour of duty. I mean, you could act, you know, these guys did it. You, you can survive. And uh, so it was a, a shot in the arm for a nation that really needed a good shot in the arm. Because in the spring of 1943, news was not good. It was not good. The, the, originally, the, the mission requirement was 25 missions, because the loss rate was over a third. And Bob would say, you know, I go to breakfast with 10 people, go to dinner with seven, you know, because three of them aren't coming back. After the 25 missions that the plane flew, the plane came home for a 32-city war bond tour. It was in running, I believe, with two other planes. One of them was with Hell's Angels, but they didn't want to see Hell's Angels doing a 32-city bond tour. So it was uh, fortunate enough to get the nod to do it. So. And then she was relegated as a war weary, is what they called them, uh, back to the States and uh, was refitted for uh, training. Back in 1946, the Bell was sent to Altus, Oklahoma. They were going to cut her up and use her for waffle irons and toasters. And that's what they did. I mean, you know, you, you don't need a whole fleet of B-17 long-range bombers uh, anymore. And a local uh, reporter uh, saw the Bell and remembered the war bond tour. So he wrote an article about it. And then the city of Memphis said, well, we had to bring that thing to Memphis for an educational tool. At that point, the city purchased it. The city of Memphis purchased it for $350. Crew was put together. Uh, the pilot of which, ironically, I think was from up around Dyersburg, Tennessee. I uh, forget his name. I think it was Lytle or something like that. And they flew it here to Memphis, uh, not without some difficulty because it hadn't been cranked up in a few months. And, and most of us remember it set up on a pedestal on Central Avenue. Where it was to be used as an educational tool. Unfortunately, the only education it provided was to show what can happen to a bunch of aluminum when it sits neglected for 60 years. Oh, vandals got into it every once in a while. They used to find the 500 pound bomb that's on a dolly out in the parking lot. And they, they could get it that far, they couldn't get it in the back of a car to steal it. But they would take it out there and they'd go and retrieve the 500 pound bomb on dolly all the time. She could have been uh, in ha housed in, a, in better conditions. The first uh, situation she was in, she was sitting actually outdoors on a platform in full weather. <clears throat> Obviously, that was not a good idea. Um, one thing that I don't think they realized is that the plane really wasn't meant to last this kind of time. It was, it was meant to last maybe a few weeks because they, uh, there was such an attrition rate for these aircraft, most of them didn't survive. Uh, and, and so there's, that's why there's not that many of them around now because they, you know, they got shot down or they were parted out for other aircraft and uh, they weren't really designed to last 60 years. Um, and so the, the, the damage started happening when it was on that platform on Central. It sat there for a while before then it later moved to the uh, airport. I know where it was. I don't like where it was. It was down in 91st Squadron sitting outside of that for a long time. Then it was moved over in fenced in area on the airport. That was not maintained. I know Federal Express used it for a while as a training aircraft for some of their maintenance people. But then uh, uh, 1985 or 86, 85, 86 time frame, the Air Force said that they were going to take it back to Dayton. And the city mobilized and they raised enough money. They had fundraising drives and they raised enough money to do a minor restoration on it and put it down on Mud Island. There wasn't enough money for a full-fledged museum, but there was enough to build a little cover fort down on Mud Island where she sat from 1986 or 87 to 2003 when we moved it up here. Margaret Polk, she was a very good friend of the organization, uh, and uh, but basically just kind of 
uh, grew disenchanted with uh, with the lack of getting a museum project going and uh, and uh, I would tell you what she would tell me but I'll I'll, I'll spare that comment. <laughs> uh, uh, her 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 feelings about the pavilion out at Mud Island were were not complimentary. <laughs> it ended up in Mud Island and had as good a facility as it could have there at that place, but it was not secure and it was not good, as you can see from all the birds' nests we've pulled out of it. And the fact that it uh, was under the cover, well, that kept the rain off of it. Of course, it didn't keep the uh, birds from leaving their calling cards on it. And it was exposed to extreme humidity swings, extreme temperature swings, uh, extreme wind-blown uh, debris, uh, and uh, birds. And the restoration crew uh, did what they could out there, but you couldn't do a, a decent job out there. Uh, you couldn't leave your tools out. And if you broke anything down, you had to put it back together that day. Or one of our uninvited guests you know, out of Mud Island would decide they would want to get a souvenir. So everything had to be shut down, so you could only do very limited tasks as far as restoration. I mean, it needed a facility that you could actually take it apart and work on things, have it laid out, so you could work on it in a, an efficient way. So that, that was the move, that was the reason to take it up there. The uh, plane was taken uh, uh, in pieces from Mud Island out to Millington. This is Hangar North 7 on um, Hornet Road on the way up to the Millington Airport. It's an excellent facility for a restoration. It's got the big central core for the fuselage and the wings, and then it's got places, built rooms around it that um, are divided out into the engines go here, the armament, and so forth, and it's broken out that way. Besides the disassembly of the plane there, this facility was in terrible shape. It's a War II facility and had to be brought up to code. Uh, we added signage. It, was, it wasn't until all that was in place that we could really start the uh, work on the plane. But you've got 40 plus uh, licensed mechanics and airplane mechanics and technicians who are in charge of this plane. If you wanted to come work on the plane, you're welcome to, but you're gonna work under them they're in charge. So there's a good structure uh, for those who want to work on the plane. We, got, we have people who come from St. Louis. There's a father and his two kids. And there are people who will take a week of vacation and come work on this plane. It's, it's, it's amazing. Paula and, uh, uh, and Jim, the two that uh, really, I think, uh, Jim Harris, Paula and Jim Harris, really more or less handled everything. She runs the uh, gift shop all the time and they're just really nice people and they've done a great job and she had some blind people she took through here that just was fantastic when they left uh, the one lady she had her put her fingers in the holes in the aircraft and to touch the aircraft and to hold a uh, 50 caliber and like that and she wrote a beautiful letter afterwards that now for the first time she could see a B-17 and that's, that's what it's all about. This is why we're doing what we're doing. Well, our dogs are fixing to divorce us because we're uh, never home. Uh, our grass gets really long because we're never down there to cut it. We're always up here. Uh, we've, we've got a lot of time put into this. It's, it's not just us. A lot of people have put a lot of time and they sacrifice uh, their own time, their families, and their own money to, for this project. And they do that because it's a worthwhile project, and uh, our World War II veterans need to be honored, and that's why it's, why it's done. Uh, the Memphis Bell is not work. I'll state that right off the bat. Uh, the people have come out to donate their time, and it is a donation. No, no one is, none of us are paid. Uh, we've all volunteered to come out to work. Uh, we don't have a set schedule. It's whatever time that we can get, but we work hard at putting the time in. As far as a labor, it's not really a labor. It's uh, more of a dedication of love because of preserving of history, uh, being able to put hands on history, to have, having something that the children can be able to see later on. Uh, it's easy to look at a book, but uh, 
you can't put it in perspective until you see actually the airplane or a ship or whatever from World War II that you can actually put it in perspective of this was the Memphis Bell. And so time-wise in years, time-wise in hours and days is not going to be important. Uh, it's going to be the most important thing is the thing is done right, the thing is done with dedication, uh, and so it's not going to be hard to do. And so there's no expense and there's no time loss. This, this is a labor of love. I came to work for Memphis Bell Association, became a member actually in uh, August of 2003. Uh, my son and I took a three-day Harley cruise and we came down here to Memphis. We heard about a bomber called the Memphis Bell and we wanted to see it and uh, went to Mud Island and uh, they said it was gone, that it was under restoration at uh, one of the uh, naval hangars. Well, the only naval hangar I knew here was the Memphis Naval Air Station. I had my A school here uh, while I was in the Navy as well. So I know where we're to go, and sure enough, it was there's only one hangar that's housed that can house a bomber like this. Uh, we went in, my son and I did. Jim Harris let us come in, and uh, from there it was love at first sight. They said that they were needing people to help restore a bomber called the Memphis Bell here, B-17, and uh, it interested me, interested my son as well, and I saw it as something that we could do together as a, as a, a family. And that's what got me involved. They were needing help. And how many chances do you have to work on a bomber from World War II? And I saw that as an opportunity to help out. I got involved with the Memphis Bell by a guy by the name of Jim Webb. He came to the Optimist Club. I was the president of the Millington Club. And he put a program on about the Memphis Bell. And he kept using the term veteran volunteer. And I wanted to know what it was after the program was over with or what a veteran volunteer was. Uh, and he told me that there was anybody that flew in combat. Well, I told him at that time, I said, well, I flew in Vietnam. And he kind of nodded his head and he took a piece of paper out and wrote a, an address on it. And he told me, he said, well, we got a meeting for veteran volunteers Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. Be there. Didn't ask me for him to join. But if you ever met Jim Webb, you'd know that Jim Webb radiated this this attitude, and so I was there. I never missed another day, another week, uh, working with the Memphis Bell. My wife was with me by my side. Uh, she knew my love for the airplane. She had no problem with me giving up my time to come out, uh, even when I she had other things. She'd go do them by herself because she knew I was coming to the Memphis Bell. I've been a tour guide on the Memphis Bell for 17 years, and have enjoyed every moment of it. I'm on the tour. I'm on the Memphis Bell board of directors. We have a meeting once a month and I enjoy getting back with the folks. But I enjoy most uh, recounting war stories with some of my comrades, guys that weren't in my outfit, you see. And uh, it's, it's, a lot of people say, you guys carry on a lot of bull, but no, it's, it's true stories. And some people are fascinated by such stories and uh, they had never heard them before, you see. So it's, uh, I take a lot of pride and, and uh, I enjoy talking with visitors. I never met them before. We get a lot of visitors from overseas, England particularly. The first time I, I heard about the move of the bell was a friend of mine, Don Bennett, he's the chaplain of the NBA, NBMA, and uh, he came to where I worked and told me they needed mechanics to help them dismantle the plane so they could move it up here to Millington. And uh, of course, first I told him I didn't know anything about aircraft but he said it's an old aircraft and it's nuts and bolts and they just need regular mechanics so I decided to go out and see if I could help them and I worked on it uh, for the last two years I've been involved in the project. Well it, it started uh, back in 1985 when I got hired here at Federal Express I found out that uh, the Memphis Bell uh, was here and I always wanted to um, uh, fly on a B-17. In fact, when I tried to join the Air Force, I asked or told the recruiter when I walked in, I said, I want to be a tail gunner on a B-17. And he got kind of fell over laughing and said, so we don't have any of those airplanes left. So uh, I wound up being a jet engine mechanic. And I got out of the Air Force after 23 years, came to Memphis, and there was the bell. So I said it was an opportunity for me to, 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 to do what my lifelong dream is to to help on a B-17. So I got started minor involvement in 1985 and 86 time frame, but then I got full-time involved in, in uh, about 1990. Been on it ever since. Well, we've uh, been down at uh, the Bell since it moved to Mud Island. We, uh, and we was working in groups on the weekend, or special 
occasions that we would go down there, uh, all of us was volunteers, and we'd go down there on the weekends or special occasions and uh, open up the bill. I started out, I saw the uh, article in the paper about the Memphis Bell and what they were doing, and so I called and found out what was going on and where it was, and I came out here and do volunteer work, and I'm normally out here on Wednesdays, and I give tours of the Memphis Bell. I did originally start out working on the Memphis Bell, but they said I was too old for that, so they let me do give tours instead. What do I think the Memphis Bell represents? Well, I see if I can get through this without getting emotional. It represents freedom. I get in trouble sometimes when I've had people ask me about uh, praying for peace and wanting peace, and that is a good concept. But I've also lived with the concept of, after 21 years in the military, that peace is a desired thing that we can have, but the only way you can have it is you have to have freedom first. And to have freedom, you've got to be willing to fight to keep your freedom because there's people that will take your freedom from you. Memphis Bell represents freedom. When Europe was under uh, the German Empire, when it was, their freedom was taken away, the United States using its aircraft, Memphis Bell was one of them, went to take that freedom back because you literally have to fight to get it back. And so it's a, it's a symbol of freedom and it's a war machine, yes, but you have to be willing to go to war to keep the freedom that you have. Because if you want peace, you can surrender and get what you call peace, but it's not really peace. And so this is a uh, symbol of freedom. It's a symbol from the past, but it represents the future to let everybody know that if you want to keep your freedom, you're going to have to be willing to stand up and be accountable. It's an item of historical real importance. It's The bell is one of three B-17s left in the world with a combat record. There's only three left out of 12,731 airplanes built during World War II. The Bell's still one of three. And there's only two others besides her that have a combat record left. And they're in museums. I, I believe the Memphians know how important the servicemen are and the, the, the role they've played in the, um, helping us have our freedom for our country, but they need to be constantly reminded. Uh, we just have had uh, Veterans Day and I think those kind of celebrations and the uh, physical signs like the bell help remind people about the sacrifices. Uh, our um, Memphis Bell Memorial Association has uh, three goals. It has a, and that is to uh, restore the plane and put it in a museum. But the second part of that is to honor the veterans honor those who have served at home and abroad. And our third element is to educate future generations to what they have done. So we, we serve a, a multi-purpose function to keep that out in front of people. And this is the biggest icon you can have. <laughs> well, the Memphis bill was reliable. It was trustworthy. It could take the punishment that no other plane could take. Uh, you knew you, you would get there and get back and uh, there was such a bond of friendship among the crew members. If one of them got hurt, it felt like you were being hurt too. But uh, the main thing was you had so much pride in the ship. It was built and it was so constructed that uh, it could take a tremendous amount of punishment and still get you back to your home base. That was my main thought, that I would get back in one piece. I, I think everybody has a story about the Memphis Bell. And for me, it's less the historical perspective as it is a personal uh, history as, as it is for the, all the people of Memphis. That's why it needs to stay here. Um, the plane was first uh, put on a pedestal on Central. And as, as a kid, every, everybody's got this story as a kid. I used to drive by there and see it. And so they have that memory. It's like a landmark in time in your life when you remember that Memphis Bell on that street. Uh, for the younger crowd, it might be Mud Island, but they remember the bell. So I think it's a, a story of 58 years here in the city of Memphis. And where were you when you saw it? Sort of like a John F. of Kennedy, where were you when he, he was shot? But um, everybody seems to have a story. I have people call me and tell me they slept under the bell 
on uh, Central, or I did this, or you know, the tour guides would tell you about the, the German, the, the former German soldier that would come and so forth, um, or another, a crew person on another plane. You know, you can't just go put another B-17F here. It, it wouldn't be the same, but there are B -F B -seven B-17 crew people who come and tell you their story. So um, it, it, it just, ex the story extends on out. So everybody's got their personal story. And then there's the story of what's happened to the plane in Memphis. And, and that's so Im important too. So it's more of a, to me, for me at least, it's a personal story about how old I was and where I was when I saw it here and I saw it there and so forth. So you can tell I'm starting to get it. <laughs> One day I was out there at Mud Island, and uh, and there was this uh, older woman uh, at that time, I guess in her 60s, uh, and she's by herself, and uh, she was looking at the pilot's cabin area. You know, she was just kind of fixed on that. She's crying. He wondered. So, was it a old lover? Uh, her late husband, uh, a brother, who was it? You know, somebody she knew, you know, went down in a plane like that. And uh, I thought of going over to her, but I figured I'd leave that moment to herself. The Memphis Bell represents something far, far bigger than the Memphis Bell. Uh, it is a, a touchstone, a, a conduit for people to uh, connect with a time when, when our country's values are very clear and, uh, and that uh, we were in a war that was accomplishing something that was universally agreed as worthwhile and needing to be done. Since October 4th, when the Air Force came into my office and visited with some of our board members, um, that's, that's the point in time, October 4th, when they came, sat down, and their first words were, we've come to exercise our right as, as part of the agreement to remove the plane from Memphis and take it to Dayton. And we sat there stunned, and we asked them why. And their reasoning was that they wanted the that they considered the Memphis Bell and the Enola Gay two of their most important possessions. And they wanted those planes in that in Dayton. Of course, the Enola Gay is in Washington in a new facility out of Dulles. But they wanted this plane with them there in Dayton so that people who came through to visit uh, for the 60th anniversary of the end of War II could, could see this. And they, they let us know there's about 1.4 million visitors to Dayton each year. We, we, would, we anticipate maybe 100,000 to 300,000, so much less, although you put this baby in a museum and it probably would even attract more. <laughs> uh, the Air Force Museums uh, move to um, exercise their 60-day uh, um, option uh, was extremely well-timed. Uh, couldn't have hit us at a worse point. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, bomber tactics during the war, they have a mission, and they know what the mission is. They know where they're going. And the bomber stream is, is trolling out there, going across the channel, going across France, going into Germany, and the Germans are trying to track them, figure out where they're going so they can hit them, you know, da da. da. And, and they have in the mission plan what they call an initial point, or an IP. And that is where the bomb run starts. From that point, they can go here, 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 here. Well, the Germans have to guess where. But the optimum place to hit them is at the IP, because that's where the bombers all have to start flying straight, where they take on one airspeed, one altitude, one fixed direction, which is the ideal situation for any aircraft and Luftwaffe fighters, you know, because you got sitting ducks on the bomb run. It's just guessing 
which target they're going to be hitting from. But the IP is the weakest point. We have been working in the MBMA smoothing wrinkled egos between the uh, War Memorial Foundation, uh, which was a foundation that should never have been uh, conceived outside of the parameters of the MBMA because it created an un unnecessary and unavoidable conflict. Uh, and, uh, you know, in my move to get a museum going back in 91, 92, I had, you know, worked with uh, others and uh, we had created a similar concept of this um, War Memorial Foundation, but it was a subcommittee to the NBMA. In other words, it was part of the parent organization. Uh, it may well wind up being the leading organization that you know, may be, you know, wind up being the tail wagging the dog, but that was okay as long as it was done through the auspices, under the auspices of the NBMA, the parent, and the foundation was done as a separate group in and of itself, and it was just a natural conflict. And that's what we did. We spent several months, a better part of a year, smoothing those wrinkles and those conflicts and basically grafted the foundation in under the umbrella of the NBMA, which is how it should have been in the first place, and then pulled the best portions of the foundation's board onto our board, and uh, and basically uh, uh, I had gotten uh, Andrew Pouncey to consider a board position because I knew he was a very talented individual in administration, and he subsequently was elected as president and brought to the found, brought to the association a uh, a talent for administration which was sorely needed, got a business plan, we had a business plan all set up, we're getting ready, you know, we got the board, Memphis Bell Memorial Association and the foundation board problems resolved and got those issues straightened out, and we're getting ready to hit the starting blocks on a fundraising drive, then we get the call from the Air Force. So basically, they hit us at our IP. We're at the most vulnerable point to get the mission done, and that's when we got hit. And uh, and there's uh, just very little defense you can offer up in that position. Uh, we were partnered with Air Force, so it's kind of difficult to fight them, you know, because you know we're basically a satellite project for the Air Force Museum. So that's when we received the first word about October 4th. Uh, we we discussed it. Um, uh, the different uh, points. We asked, if we had all the money in the world right now to do all that we wanted, would you change your mind? They said no. I said, uh, if we had our museum under construction, would you change your mind? They said no. Of course, I think that's the only position they could take. I know the aircraft was not taken care of properly. It was not supported properly by the city of Memphis, and uh, it did not get the support that was needed to maintain it. Then the, that's one reason the Air Force is looking at taking it. But by the same token, uh, now there is an organization that is working together as a group. They're consolidated, and I believe they're doing a good job in maintaining it and trying to get it uh, in good condition for a museum here in Memphis where it should stay. They just have to realize that, that the bell has, has been here for almost 60 years. It's not the Dayton Bell or the Savannah Bell or the Toledo Bell. It's the Memphis Bell. And she's been here since 1946. And her, her, her namesake, Margaret Pope, is buried here. Uh, she just needs to stay here. It, uh, it really does. The, the, the primary actions for saving the bell have come from the Memphis Bell Memorial Association. And we've approached our friends, our members of the association, and uh, city agencies. We're working on government agencies right now to uh, work with us to save the bell. Uh, there are articles in papers that from the Commercial Appeal to the Carnival Independent to uh, raise the awareness. Now, you, you have to remember, too, in all this, is that the Memphis Bell Memorial Association is a partner with the Air Force in this agreement. And the association is trying to take the high road in that we're looking out for the plane, for its 
its best use. So whether it stays here in Memphis or it goes to Dayton, it's going to be well taken care of. So we're very careful about how what position we take here. We have uh, written a letter to our legislators. So there's one group. We've written to our legislators asking them to um, work with us to reverse the decision by the Air Force to take the plane from Memphis to Dayton and then help us set up an irrevocable agreement to have the plane remain here in Memphis so we can continue the restoration and put it in a permanent climate controlled museum. I was a little prejudiced about uh, moving it out here because I was saying, it ain't going to never get back down to the island again or, or wherever they was counting on a building a hangar for it. There was supposed to be a meeting with the uh, Senator Frist and Senator Alexander's office with the Air Force Museum officials um, a couple weeks ago and uh, the Air Force canceled the meeting um, and there's no indication they had any plans of, of rescheduling it anytime soon uh, so I think they're basically just kind of biding their time and sort of letting what fever's out there just kind of calm down and let Memphis do its usual Memphis thing and move on to other issues and, and uh, you know, sort of lose its concern. To look at the Memphis Bell the way it is now, with the engines off, the wings off, being able to get up to it and touch the aircraft, when it goes to a museum, all refurbished, all set up, you will not cross a rope that is near the aircraft. You will be walking around the aircraft right now you can see every part of the aircraft people look at the engines never seen a recip engine how it works you can see the whole thing torn down with the jugs off with the parts off with the uh, uh, exhaust collector rings off of it and like that the struts are off the aircraft uh, it's all torn down you can walk around and touch every part of it just about and and look in the bomb bay and get up close to it and uh, it's just so interesting to be able to get right beside the aircraft, which you will not be able to do once it gets there. Look at where the fuel cells were, where the oil tanks were, how the engines are mounted on, how the wings are mounted on the aircraft. This is things people will never be able to see once it goes to a museum. So while it's here, the people that tour it here get a very extensive tour of the aircraft. In uh, 1976, the plane was given back to the Air Force by the city of Memphis. The uh, plane would stay in the city of Memphis though so that it would educate the public and be restored by the Memphis Bell Memorial Association and that's been carried on since then. Part of that agreement was that at any point the Air Force could take that plane and probably every five years the Air Force has gotten itchy about the plane. So this is not new what's going on right now. It's just they've become serious about it. It's their real serious attempt to, to take the plane uh, from the city of Memphis. I think that's important for people to know because that's a little bit of background on how we got to this point. It just didn't walk out of here with the Air Force. And actually, we still have it, so. Why did Memphis sell it back to the Air Force? Good question. <laughs> I was not around at that point. I have no clue. Uh, and and don't, don't print this part. I, I really don't know. And I don't know that you'd want to ask those that were around then. I think it would, buy, it would hurt them. Uh, one of the moves to get the museum project going, again, we had the general apathy of the city of Memphis. Uh, and at that time, heavens, you had uh, guys like uh, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, uh, Chief of Police Tony Gagliano, who was a ball turret gunner in the 92nd Bomb Group. Uh, he had uh, the uh, mayor of Memphis, uh, Ingram, who was a P-51 pilot. In other words, you had people who were in positions of influence and authority to get this project going. And uh, again, you know, that's, it's, uh, and, it, and it couldn't happen then. And uh, so it's even harder to make that connection now, you know. And uh, uh, but uh, so to sort of motivate uh, the uh, city of Memphis and the city fathers um, to kind of create a crisis, uh, the 
and I wasn't there at the genesis of this, but 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 the lease was given over to, um, uh, or the ownership was given over, signed over to the U.S. Air Force Museum as part of their inventory. In other words, if we can't do anything with it, then maybe they can, and and we use them to sort of create a mandate to get something going and uh, uh, and that worked very well to our favor up, up until recently and that mandate has kind of come back to haunt us. You, you have a, a very emotional following of the bell that's that you, you can see that from other people you've interviewed and such and those people we need to write letters to our legislators, legislators and to the Air Force to help reverse this decision. Um, but you know, what's interesting is that we, we are like the, the generation of the sons and daughters. And those that were there at the time in the 40s, their numbers are dwindling. And I believe this would, would have been best if it had, if it had, been take, if it had taken place when they were the CEOs that held the purse strings who could have had the money to build this museum. It didn't happen. So now it's upon the sons and daughters to stand up and do the same thing. And so it's really upon our backs uh, because we're the ones coming of age and, and making the money to where we can hopefully take this on and make it succeed. And we're doing it for our parents' generation. That's the way I see it. One of the closing lines in that really fine film done by Steven Spielberg, Saving Private Ryan, and uh, where the uh, Tom Hanks character, uh, Captain Miller, is about at his end, and uh, and he, you know, and all this is going on to uh, ostensibly to pull this one guy out and get him back home, and uh, in, in in his closing remarks is is earn this, earn this. And uh, and I, so the way I look at it is that uh, we all need to look at this from a perspective that we have a freedom and, and a bounty in this country uh, that is owed to somebody else who isn't here. Uh, you know, pieces of them are scattered all over Europe. Um, and, uh, and if we don't conduct ourselves in a way that pays proper and due tribute to those guys, um, it's like taking them out and killing them all over again. And, uh, and I think that's a real sin. And, uh, and I, I think that that's a story that can be told here in this museum. Uh, uh, and that story will be lost uh, if it's not done locally here with attention, you know, with personal attention. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't wish to see the Memphis Bell logged in as artifact number you know, 415 or whatever. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's it's uh, th th there's just a personal history there that uh, that's going to be lost. You know that you know, and that's you know, really all I can say about that. Uh, the people of Memphis are the reason why this plane even exists. The Air Force had thrown it away. She su survived obsolescence by the Air Force. She was going to jump. Period. She would have been our beer cans and things like that. And uh, because of the people of Memphis, they went and saved the plane. And their efforts ought to be rewarded. She ought to stay here because this is who she belongs to. But all along we knew it was the property of the U.S. government. And if they say they want it, uh, I guess they, they have the right to say they want it, you know. But I sure hate to see it leave Memphis. I think that the, uh, the Bell is a status for Memphis because it was named the Memphis Bell. It was the first crew that uh, flew 25 missions in total over there completed their missions. Uh, I think it's a, a great historical asset for Memphis, and I believe Memphis should maintain it and keep it. Uh, I don't believe that there's any other city that should uh, put any claims to it, but 
there again, if only if Memphis will do what Memphis should do, support it, build an, uh, a good facility for it, and put it in there as a museum piece. It should be where everybody can see it. If it hadn't been for the aircraft such as this and the rest of the military, we would be speaking German today. And uh, this is a, a great asset, and it needs to be preserved, but it doesn't need to preserve, be preserved away from Memphis. It seems that uh, projects that uh, succeed are the type of projects that corporations and politicos uh, can grandstand best on to uh, mass appeal sports events, you know, you know, you know NBA sports teams and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the FedEx Forum. Uh, it's a dedication of love. Uh, I love freedom. I love the airplane. I love Memphis. I want to keep the airplane in Memphis. And uh, they, they have not seen the emotion that I will have if they take it out of here. And as I told the people on Channel 3, that if the wheels go in the well on the C-5, that third emotion will come out. And a lot of people are not going to like it. I mean, I'm not a violent person, but I got a good pen, I got a good pencil, and I can write some real nice stuff. And so they're going to see that emotion come out, and I'm going to make some people unhappy that they let the Memphis Bell get away from us. So um, I'll, I'll do anything I have to, anything I can, uh, without getting violent. You <laughs> can't do that, because that's not, not legal no more. Uh, but to keep the Memphis Bell here, because it belongs in Memphis. This is the Memphis Bell. It's not the Dayton Bell. It's the Memphis Bell, and we want to keep her here. And, uh, she's a sweet lady. The more you see it, the more you'll love it, or love her, I should say, because we talk of our airplanes like her ladies, and uh, the older they get, the sweeter they get, and the better they get. So she's a sweet lady. And I personally take it as a direct offense, personally, uh, that you cannot interest the city government or local corporations in in promoting and pushing a project like this forward because all of the pleasures that they enjoy, all the influence, all the benefits, all the riches that they enjoy, all the freedoms they enjoy uh, were paid for by somebody else. One of the big differences in the restoration they propose and the one that we're proposing is that the skin that you see, much of that skin is original. And there are parts that have been taken off and so forth because through time and, and the weather and elements, especially of Mud Island, there's been corrosion of that material. Uh, so um, they are going to take that skin off all the way down and start again. I mean, it's like taking history away and if you look at some of these portions, if you've toured around the facility here, they'll, the, the tour guides will show you pieces that have the, the holes where the flak was, where the Germans shot up through it, and that's still on this plane in places. So there's, there's pieces of history that would be removed if it went to Dayton, and we intend to keep those because that to me is part of the, the historical perspective on that plane. It's, I know. I cannot even fathom the logic on that, uh, you know, because uh, uh, she's a veteran. You know, she's got bumps and rattles that she earned, and uh, uh, it's uh, that makes her a brand new B-17. Uh, you know, so what's the story in that? I mean, it's kind of like a it's kind of like putting up a historical plaque saying this is the former site of a very historic house that used to be here. <laughs> so he point out and says, well, there used to be flak holes here. There used to be, uh, you know, you used to see machine gun, you know, 50 caliber, you know, uh, you know, uh, patch marks here. But it, it's not there, so, you know, what's the point? Uh, you know, that's, uh, that's not restoration. That's not, that's not preservation. That's reconstruction. Let me say this. There are three, there's about two or three views on the movement of the belt, okay? One is that there's some people who want to fight for it, and that's fine. There are some who believe that it's going to a higher plane, no pun intended, but it just means that it can be 
viewed by more people now. We've had our opportunity and now others have that uh, time to uh, share with the bell. Okay. And then there's a lot of folks that are just have had their heart torn out. And those primarily are the restoration guys who have put in 7,500 to 10,000 man hours since March of 03. And this is early November 04. That's a lot of time away from family, vacation, et cetera, to do, to do that for something you love and then just have it taken away quickly. So some, they have pulled back for the moment. I believe they're ready to go again. But there's gonna, it's going to take a recovery time for them to get over what's just happened. So you got those who want to fight, you got those that are okay with the move, and you got those who are just worn out by it all. Uh, meantime, we are the MBMA, and we are still a partner with the Air Force, and we're trying to look after that plane, whether it stays in Memphis or it goes to Dayton. And we'll be going with, we're going to follow every part if it goes to Dayton all the way. So. I just want to see the thing succeed. I just don't know if the Air Force Museum is going to let that happen. Playing hardball. Everyone I've talked to, the first thing that they'll come out and tell me is they're kind of shocked and they're kind of awed that the Air Force would want to take the airplane to Dayton, Ohio. Uh, yes, Dayton, Ohio is a nice museum, but this is the Memphis Bell. They come to Memphis to see the Memphis Bell, and it would be almost out of place from across the world, from Europe, Asia, from Africa. We've had, I've had people from every part of the United States, and every one of them has expressed the same thing. The bell belongs here. This is Memphis Bell's, uh, the Memphis Bell, and it's the Memphis Bell's place to be in Memphis. And so I have yet to find anyone, I mean, not zero, that would want the plane moved. And uh, they've all volunteered to take and do what they could to help keep the plane in Memphis. My opinion for Memphis losing the bell, I, I think it's probably interest. Um, I see that there's really, there's only a few people that want to that keep it going. People are always invited to come here to keep it going. We need numbers, we need people of interest. Uh, maybe it's a lull in Memphis, they got other priorities in mind, uh, developmental reasons for the land. Um, there's just not, not a public um, publicity out there for it, as it should be. Maybe with the ingredient of that and, of course, development that they have other interests right now somewhere else. And I hate to see them lose a bomber like the Memphis Bell. Uh, Memphis is a difficult town to get uh, public benefit projects going uh, if there's not a direct corporate profitable tie-in. I, I haven't seen any effort from the city officials to keep the bell. They just, if it stays, it stays. If it don't, it don't. That was their attitude. I thought we'd get more than, than we did. Uh, I'm kind of disappointed that we didn't, but uh, they've got priorities too, and you know, that's, uh, there's other things that have to be done. So I can understand it, but I, I, I am really disappointed in the support that we received often said if you don't know your history you're destined to repeat it and Memphis is a uh, Memphis has got a PhD on that so <laughs> but uh, it's a great city but it's uh, it could be greater and uh, it's a shame that uh, our icons are um, seemingly proverbially going to Ohio <laughs> uh, whoever heard, you know whoever thinks of Cleveland Ohio and I think of rock and roll <laughs> Well, I, I would have hoped that long ago that this, this beautiful plane would have uh, been restored and in a museum. And again, now it's that, that responsibility is placed on the next generation to uh, accomplish that task. I uh, hope that Charles project is of some uh, benefit to keeping the aircraft here. Uh, I have my doubts that that, that will happen but at least uh, you're documenting yet another phase of the history of this project and uh, uh, it's uh, it's kind of a I've got mixed emotions about it it's just a bitter pill to swallow because uh, I had really 
envisioned that it was going to be an opportunity to offer something to the general public uh, to inform them of what was done, you know, for them by others. And uh, you know, you know, the, you know the, uh, I think that uh, you know that the general populace, uh, they have a debt of gratitude that just cannot ever be fully repaid. And uh, for the most part, I don't give a damn. You know, I don't care. You know, what does World War II have to do with me? Well, uh, everything. <laughs> everything. This dirty little town It always gets you down It makes you wear a frown Is getting prime. It's not your fault this time, but you have done no crime. Tonight you're gonna go to your favorite hideaway. No one else can find you for days and days and days. You're gonna go This time you stay They left you here for dead A price was on your head And you were hanging by a thread Hardcore to the end You were no man's friend You just can't pretend See through your despair You fight it to maintain But it's too late for prayer Now you're a lightning rod You'll be a memory in time Forgotten in your prime You'll forever be sublime Tonight you're gonna go To your face